Hello, Helena. It's Emily McVeigh, Executive Director of the United Way of the Lewis and Clark area. We're here for this week's United Way Partner Spotlight with the YWCA and Jen Gursky. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. Right. Well, brush us up a little bit on the general mission of the YWCA. Yeah, thanks for having me, Emily. Uh, YWCA Helena seeks to prevent homelessness, um, and we provide uh, safe and supportive uh, services for homeless women and children. Um, and then we seek to restore hope and self-sufficiency that leads to healthy, happy lives. Great. That's the mission. We do that by operating um, a state endorsed and licensed substance use recovery program, um, operating 24 rooms um, as transitional housing and some sheltering. And then we also have a mental health center and a trauma-informed therapeutic childcare. Yeah, you're very busy. Hey, we're <laughs> hopping. And your mission is to prevent homelessness. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing this summer? It's a little different. Yeah. Um, you know, I think as a community, we saw a lot of Band-Aids ripped off through COVID, right? Yep. Like, I don't think that homelessness just happened because COVID happened. I think our resources were depleted because of COVID. And so what we saw was more exacerbated in how we deliver services to folks that need them the most. And then what we've seen also in Lewis and Clark County is an exponential increase of people moving into our community and population growth. Um, the Washington Post just reported um, that we are one of the fastest growing rental markets in the nation in Lewis and Clark County. Um, and we have a pretty steady increase of uh, folks coming in and living permanently, both folks and higher incomes, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's pushing that housing market up. I think what we're seeing out of that is um, increased folks on our lists, right? So I know that United Way, you're observing some of this too, but um, lists to get into emergency shelter, lists to get into transitional housing, lists for more services, um, we uh, we recently did um, an audit of folks that we serve on a daily basis. And with the expanded services that we have, we're serving nearly 100 people every single day in YWCA services. Um, that's coming from being able to serve up to 24 women and 20 children in the shelter. And then when we opened our childcare, we're serving, we have full census already, um, zero to five, right? Ages zero to five, and that's 28 kiddos. Um, and we are launching in um, Stewart Homes, which is that housing area over by Helena High. And we are gonna open um, another 16 spots for ages four and five and start some uh, trauma-informed therapeutic preschool. Mm -hmm. um, that with the Caterpillars Parenting Center. So we also do supervised parenting and parenting classes. Um, we have a child therapist and um, children's mental health services. So um, offer a lot of parent-child reunification, child mental health therapy, um, and all of the people Seriously, in all, every single one of those services, every single day, it turned out to be 98 souls that we're serving every single day. Um, that's a huge increase from the last couple of years that we have been in operation, right? And I talked to our partners who are doing work like ours, um, and they're very full. You know, people are languishing on waiting lists. So I think the other thing that, you know, we've seen recently, and I'm really, um, really quite happy actually to see that it has been given enough highlights, uh, both at the city level and um, in the IR, but the encampment of folks that are being told to transition, you know, every couple of weeks and they're done, right? Like, where do they go? And I think we're seeing more of that. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, just extending back even a couple of months from summer, one of the things that has really stuck with me in the work that we do is that report on homelessness that we get from the Helena Public Schools, right? And I know that there's different levels, but that report tells us that there are over, you know, about I think it's the number is 380 Mm -hmm. um, that they reported in May of kiddos that were unsecurely housed. And so what, what that turns out to be is a lot of phone calls from people who are living in their cars, right? In the summer, they're living in campgrounds, yep. right? Um, and some of them, 
are living out really far out from essential services because they're living in their cars or an RV, et cetera. And so then they're paying that extra resource to get into town um, to access food share. Um, yeah, it, it seems like the need in our community in, um, is not only increasing, but it's intensifying. And I think our community, it feels like we're starting to say, whoa, the, the, things, the things that our community needs, the folks that are living right at that edge, um, seems to be increasing and what what is our community response to that right yeah, yeah. our point in time survey number was 164 yeah. this year a 13 percent increase from last year right. but that number doesn't include those kids no that are living in campers or couch surfing right. with family right um, those kids don't get counted in that right. number or even on the brinks right so right. like right outside like the skirts of town where nobody's going to bother them right we don't um, knock on camper doors in the nighttime in right. january so we miss that yeah that population of people yeah, yeah. absolutely so the number is much higher than 164 absolutely. we know that to be true yeah yeah um so even a 13 percent increase doesn't accurately tell us what the true number is no. we just know that the increase is right population is increasing in the 30s right mm -hmm. and so it is fair to say when rents are also increasing and just pure price by 35% in just the last year. It is safe for me to say with much confidence <laughs> that that's a, that's a complete underrepresentation of the actual right. need. When you talked about people moving into town, yeah. that creates a shuffle where our local population is actually losing the housing and that's what's creating an Absolutely. unsheltered situation is mm -hmm. not people moving to town to be unsheltered. Right. Mm -hmm. It is our local Right. families, right. our local individuals who are becoming unsheltered. I know that's always a As topic. the rental market increases, right? So a standard three bedroom, a partner right here, he, a three bedroom place now in Lewis and Clark County is well beyond $2,000 a month, yep. probably about $2,500 a month for a basic, and that could even be an apartment, right? Um, I don't know who affords that. You and I can't afford that. Don't, nope. <laughs> That is not, that is more than my mortgage by right. far. Yeah, right. yeah. but right. it's creating an unsheltered situation. And I know last we were looking at statistics from our HIMIS housing management information systems mm -hmm. data showing that 70 to 75% of the local populations are local people from Montana. They are 100%. not out of staters. 100%. And so when people say, well, people shouldn't move to Montana right. to be homeless, that is a I bit silly because it's cold would here. I to Montana for negative 20 degree weather <laughs> if they were unsheltered, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not who we're seeing here. We're, we're seeing folks with tangible connections to our community, yeah. with kiddos in schools, right? With parents that have jobs um, that just can't make this market work for themselves. But they um, don't want to leave because and they're this our is people, their home. Right, and not yeah. to say, you know, to, to be outsider for your base, but there are people. They are our baristas. They mm -hmm. are our folks that are working at, in some of our service industries. But they're also people who are working what we would consider high-end jobs, right? Jobs that might be in the trades. Jobs right. that um, I have um, a couple of women who gave up a business, right? I have a woman in shelter right now that used to own a bakery. Um, the reality is not that people are moving here from California as people who need shelter, right? right. That's where our folks are moving because it's warmer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that the, I think it's a very real concern. Um, and I'm really glad to see it getting some, you know, some front page coverage. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so how many women and children are you serving right now? Yeah. So. We you talk have, about 98 people per day, but... Yeah, isn't that... We lot. literally just did this audit, and it was like, it was such a... Because I think that we talk a lot about our shelter, right? Yeah. We talk a lot about housing. Um, but in the last four years, we've really expanded our services. Yeah. So in shelter, right now, we have 18... Let me look here. 18 women and 15 kiddos. Um, in our child care, we have 28 and we're, um, as, as of September 1st, we're going to expand that total number to 44. In our um, Caterpillars Parenting Center that does the parenting, the community base, so you don't have to be um, living in the YWCA to receive these services. In our Caterpillars that does um, safe exchanges and supervised parenting and um, parenting classes, um, we're at 11 families. 
Um, and then we have, um, we have some folks that are um, community-based coming to our children's mental health services. And I think, you know, when we finally did that audit of, you know, they're not, those are not unique individuals from day to day, like those are the same individuals, but those are the individuals that we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. right? So not everybody in our childcare, actually a very few percentage of um, our childcare, because it's zero to five, we have a lot of school-aged kiddos right now in the shelter. And so those are community um, children that have had a traumatic experience, have experienced a CPS removal or an out-of-home placement, and live at 185% of the poverty level. Um, these are kiddos with some challenging behaviors, right, because of so many transitions in their lives. These are folks that qualify for um, SNAP, Medicaid, uh, Best Beginnings. Um, so yeah, we're at about 98 folks and all of them are at the brink, right? So yeah, the, I mean, it's just more, I, the, the reason that I wanted to share that is because it feels like as we have built the programming around the shelter and the women's and children's services, we've made sure as the need has um, revealed itself in our women's lives, so childcare was something that once the woman um, was in recovery, um, had employment, and then sought out housing. The minute her child care crashed through, which is often with mm -hmm. these families because these guys have big behaviors and big emotions when they're little, right? But the minute that the stability of child care left, you lost housing, you lost job, and you're right back with us, you know, in 24 to 36 months. So we started child care because we wanted a full wraparound service model. And what we're seeing is more success in uh, women's recovery rates and family reunification and then independence in the community if we can ever find them housing, <laughs> um, way beyond that 36 to 60 month period. So it's kind of, it's good, awesome work. Um, but that's who and how we're serving right now. Right, and the next question is about challenges, and you mentioned Medicaid, so just roll right oh, into yeah. that. <laughs> so um, during the COVID era, um, the feds uh, made it, um, made, uh, made uh, what do I wanna say? Um, made it available, made it possible for coverage um, to not only be expanded, but just to be covered even if somebody turned out that they were not eligible, right? Right before COVID hit, we had this session where the Montana legislature decided um, that we wanted to take away the presumptive eligibility. So what do I mean? What it means is, instead of now having to go every six months to 12 months that we presume you are eligible in those time periods, what we've turned out to is a month by month eligibility. So Sounds real like world- a lot of paperwork. Real world application, right? I have women in the house that have spent the last three weeks, three days of those weeks, going down to the Medicaid office just so they could put their face in front of a worker for them to say, we have all of your paperwork. I bet you are going to be determined eligible, but we are still working it. Why? Because staffing is an issue, right? But I think also further why of like, why are we kicking off people in Medicaid when we have the fastest rents? We have an increasing population of folks that are living at the brinks of our economy. Um, and it not doesn't only affect like right like it affects the the lives and the timeliness. I'm thinking about all of the folks that are working right now. I have a woman who works part time for us who is on Medicaid, and she has had to leave work twice in the last twice each week in the last three weeks just so she can deliver the papers that is necessary. Um, I, it's. It's not dignified. Not a great system. It's right not now. dignified, and I think it's pretty cruel. Um, I'm thinking about all the kiddos that were lapsed off um, coverage. I'm thinking of really our working poor. Um, I read a report that 17,000 people in Lewis and Clark County alone have been kicked off of Medicaid in the last month. Um, what that does to our healthcare system as well. I mean, we can all champion the provider rate increases that we did all throughout the session. Um, and it doesn't matter if I, if Medicaid is one of the models 
one of the ways that I am able to sustain the shelter and the programs that we offer in our community. Having families kicked off of it takes that pretty reliable piece of funding out of my hands and how I deliver services. So now you have a woman and a child that's not covered, and now you have the shelter and the programmings that are trying to serve them not have a reliable source of income. Um, I, it's a reality. I don't know how to fix it yet. Um, but even if today if all I do is say, please write somebody <laughs> to talk about um, this, uh, this Medicaid fiasco. Um, I also think um, as far as challenges are, I would say, I think we're facing three challenges, and I think it's I think it's shared with us at the YWCA across some of the agencies that we're working with in our community, but certainly we are feeling it at um, a pretty crunch time. Housing availability and housing stock. I have four women in the shelter right now that have done all of their programming, have graduated, have jobs, and they have their um, vouchers for housing, and they can't find a house. And they're about on their third time to finally lose the voucher and have to get back on the list, right? Mm -hmm. um, what that does is that we have folks ready to be self-sufficient, ready to go into our community, ready to live what that next step in their life is. We have no housing available to them. That's a problem, right? Our second one, I would say in our community, and we are certainly feeling this, is we don't actually have an answer to a warming shelter. And I would say winter is... Or a cooling shelter or in the summer. For, on, yeah. for real, right? Today. Yeah. Today it's a lot. Um, I think, you know, I, um, the peer at our place, I loved it. In his last email, he's like, just a reminder, we're 60 days out from Halloween, which is usually when we get our first snow. And that is one of the things that I have been communicating. Like, Halloween is when we put our costumes on over our snowsuits. Yep. And it is two months away. I and keep we saying still, six weeks. Right? So. We still don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah. We don't have an answer as a community. Not only was it awful last year with some of the severe temperatures that we had, I really thought we had some momentum. Um, that's a challenge. We don't have a conclusive, collaborative way to emergency house people. We don't have a collective, collaborative way to provide a warming shelter when it's negative 20 outside. I think that's a huge challenge because it also puts strains on how we serve people and how we can resource people. And then that third challenge that I would say is as we, as the inflationary index continues to grow, right? Um, and we're feeling it in our families and um, we're feeling it even in just this conversation, right? Um, the resources that the YWCA um, is able to um, to receive to do our services, there's not really an inflationary index that came with that, right? Mm -hmm. So our federal grants, our Medicaid reimbursement rates are half of what they are um, for private healthcare. Um, we continue to have a resource crunch at a critical time when we're trying to recruit staff, um, where the wages have grown exponentially in the last three years. Um, where we're trying to serve with those staff, the people that need our services, right? Um, energy alone in that 20,000 square foot shelter, um, our energy bills right now are over $3,000 a month. Two years ago, they were 15. Yep. Yeah, so <laughs> um, as an agency, we're feeling that crunch, right? right? So those are some of that. Those are the things that I would list as our top challenges. Challenge. Yeah, we hear it every day. People on the pantry at our office and yeah. just having a hard time putting food on the table. Absolutely. Clothes. People getting ready for school is it's it's heartbreaking to hear yeah. the stories. Yeah. Yeah. Shoes. Definitely Shoes for kids. feeling it. Birthdays. Um, well, I had a mom out on the pantry looking through the stuff on our little pantry, going, "I just want to get something nice for my daughter for her birthday." One hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. We get that a lot. We get a lot of calls for diapers. So one of the other things that we do is we um, do a Mother's Day drive every mm -hmm. May and we collect diapers in town and we are the agency that then gives the diapers out. So maybe we want to put some on our pantry um, 
that's actually a really great idea, but we always send we, people to Catholic Social Services. We supply yeah. Catholic mm -hmm. Social Services. We supply the Friendship Center. Um, I think we've done some diaper runs to Florence Crittenden. So we have a couple of storage units that are just filled with diapers that we do all throughout the year from that May drive. Um, but that's a call that we're getting a yeah. lot and also feminine products. Yeah. Like they're expensive and when you can, you know, do hot dogs and canned uh, green beans, you're not not buying an $8 box of tampons, right? And so yeah. who are you going to call, right? And it's usually a woman serving agency. And so we're getting a lot of calls like that, yeah. which when we're talking about dignified service, right? That's, I mean, that's just, that's where we want to come in is being able to offer dignity. Yep. So what are some of the highlights that you see? We talked about oh challenges. Oh my gosh. What are the good things? Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, I actually think the challenges that we're experiencing being highlighted right now, it feels like there's some really good community buzz mm -hmm. about trying to find solutions, right? So um, thinking about Rad and his um, friends, thinking about that encampment, working with agencies like yours and Good Samaritans and then the city commission and thinking like, Yes, we need longer term solutions, but what's the solution right now for those folks, right? And so, I mean, I've had a number of communications about, you know, this is what the Y can offer. Here's Good Sam's. What do we have in vouchers? What do they want, right? And I think that is bubble, bubbling and percolating out to then, I think, the warming shelter conversation, right? When was the last time in this community you started talking about a warming shelter before the day we needed it? Not often. Right? Like, well, we that, talk about we it a lot. We talk about it, but the community doesn't, <laughs> yeah. right? And so I'm hearing those conversations right now, like, oh, yeah, this group. And also, winter is coming. Mm -hmm. Like, did we ever figure out what we were going to do? And the answer is no. And so we can pull folks in in August right now. So I think that's a definite highlight and yes. a bright spot right now. Mm -hmm. It feels like that community conversation and collaborative solutions making is happening. I also... Um, think that you are a highlight of our <laughs> agency. I think some of the work that you are doing to propel these conversations, so I'm thinking about, you know, the St. John's building, and I'm also thinking about some of the, um, like the resource advocates that get together and some of the convening that United Way does. So it's kind of like similar, right? But I think that those spaces being held for agency providers, right? And to see like, okay, you are doing this, you are doing that, how do we get together? And then how do we push that story out, right? Because we know really great people in this community that if they just knew the story, I know that they'd want to help, mm -hmm. which I think leads me to my last bright spot. I hear the community wanting to help, right? Like I hear more and more as I present needs, people are like, I can do that for you, or I can come and volunteer for that, or um, we had a recent need, like literally we had pillows in the house that like we were getting a lot of linens, but we weren't getting new pillows for the women and then the little travel pillows for the kiddos in the mm -hmm. rooms, right? And I was talking about that to, at, a, at the Pride Parade with somebody. I was like, actually, our biggest need right now is pillows. And she's like, done. I'm going to deliver you 24 pillows on Monday. And lo and behold, we got a big old stack of pillows on Monday, right? So I think that people are starting to say, what is the very tangible way yeah. that I can provide assistance? Because I'm an accountant at the state. I'm not going to be the social worker, but how can I help in my role, right? And I'm seeing more of that right now. And I think that that, I think we live in a really great community and I think we just need to figure out how to put those resources together to meet those needs. Yep. Yeah. Maybe Helena's it's a little Pollyanna, great. but They're I really supportive. just like, I really feel that in my bones. No, I think you're right. That's been, we run into groups all the time. They're like, oh, we've been out raising yeah. money for socks or, you know, yeah. all the, yeah. you know, they just hear of a need and they go about getting it done. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we'll hear of like, you know, whatever group sometimes, it's a lot of Girl Scouts actually, a lot of Girl Scouts troops comes in and they're like, here, we did a feminine products drive or here's at the toiletries, you know, that we've raised. So it's just, I think the more that we can give tangible ways, I mean, always cash is king, right? But yeah. <laughs> the more we can provide tangible ways for experts to come in and help our community solutions, we're, we're just stronger for it. And I think we're starting to see a lot of that right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think this community is really starting to listen. Yeah. And it's been really great. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's I wonderful. agree. All right, well, how can people help support the Y? You got some events, at least one event coming up. We have a great event coming <laughs> up. It's um, the one time in the year where our community can gather in a single space, um, not the whole community, because it only holds 600 people, but- <laughs> 600. Um, 600. Um, it's called the Rise and, Shine Rise and Shine Breakfast, and it is the benefit breakfast where we get to really highlight some of the work that our women are doing. Um, they get to share some of their story, and the community gets to respond by donating, by partnering. By We like to give an opportunity for people to partner, and a lot of folks in that room rise to that challenge and partner with us. Um, it's on September 13th, which is a Wednesday. Um, the event is at 8.30, doors open at 8. And right now, we are busy trying to find people who want to attend. So people who want to table captain, people who want to attend, um, you can go out to our website, um, which is ywchelena.org, and just click on that events button and go there. The other way is just a direct donation. Still on our website, go click donate. Um, and the other one is just give us a buzz. Do you think that you have a skill that can help? Like right now, we're really looking for gardeners to help us landscape out front and get it ready for fall, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have a child care that is brimming with little kids. Um, we love grandparents who want to come in and read stories. Um, so there's a lot of different ways. Come to the Rise and Shine Breakfast. Learn more about us September 13th in the morning. Um, donate online or swing by and let's figure out how we can help you uh, volunteer with a lot with the 98 people that we serve every single well, day. Well I heard you're hiring for child care staff. We are hiring for child care <laughs> staff because who isn't? Right? Um, absolutely <laughs> hiring um, for child care staff um, and because we're launching that new uh, four and five year old place out in Stuart Homes so very excited. Um, about the things that we're doing and it feels on our side it feels pretty tangible too. Great. Any last words? I think just gratitude. Gratitude. Thanks for having us um, mm -hmm. as your organization highlight and thanks to our community for continually supporting us. Uh, we've been kicking around the block in Helena, Montana for um, over a hundred years now mm -hmm. and um, I think we're stronger now than we have ever been. Yeah. So thanks. We've come a long way since we really have. the last few years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It feels good to have that report out to the community. Yep, definitely. Well, thanks for joining us, yeah. Jen. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Helena. We'll see you again next week.